Welcome friends to the Someone Gets Me podcast. I am your host, Diane Allen, and I am so delighted that you're here. This podcast was created because I believe there is a visionary leader inside each one of us who is waiting to be seen. In each episode of Someone Gets Me, you will hear useful tips from successful visionaries who will share their stories about how being seen has allowed them to take their vision out into the world with action. How to find your gifted voice with Aaron Roth. Today's episode is going to cover social contracts, authenticity, communication, Shakespeare, acting, and all kinds of other things. Not in really quite sure where it's all going. But Erin Roth and I have crossed paths numerous times, and uh, she's in New York City. And Erin is a very talented and gifted performer. And right now she's playing Lady Macbeth. And that's not for the lightweights. Now, when I met Erin and she was talking about Shakespeare and her love for Shakespeare, I immediately have this warm spot because I personally love Shakespeare. But more than that, one of the gifted teenagers that I know who is so dear to my heart is a thespian and his favorite thing are Shakespeare monologues. And he's a teenager and I love him. And when I met Aaron, I think of him and it's just this beautiful synergy. So I really want to talk about how all of this happens, how as gifted people, we can find our voice in an authentic way and whatever else Aaron wants to talk about, including the social contract that we all engage in when we connect with other people. So Aaron, welcome so much to the Someone Gets Me podcast. And I'm so delighted that you're taking time out with your new baby and and opening the bath to be here with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's such a pleasure to be here. And I wanted to sit down with you for so long. So uh, it's wonderful. Oh, this is, I'm so excited. Um, Erin just had a baby not long ago and she's in, she's doing a lot of things. And so this is like an act of magic that we got <laughs> together. <laughs> Whenever anything happens with a young baby, it's an act of magic. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So I, I, I mentioned a little bit about you and Shakespeare and acting, but give us a little like cliff note version of what turned you on to Shakespeare and, and how did you get to where you are? And then I want to, I want to unpack it a little bit more about the how to's, but give us a little yeah. back Aaron backstory. I would love that. It's actually really funny because my first interaction with Shakespeare was in sixth grade and uh, all of our English classes were putting on Shakespeare plays, very abridged versions, and we were doing Macbeth, and I was cast as Lady Macbeth when I was in sixth grade, which is so funny to have it come all the way back around to playing her again. Um, I don't know exactly what it was, but I loved it so much, and I think it was one of the first times that people looked at me and said, wow, you're really good at that. (laughs) And I said, oh, oh, great. I also really enjoy doing it. Um, But it happened to be at a pretty difficult period of my life. So I sort of, I took that love of acting and I sort of buried it down deep within myself and I didn't let myself act again for at least another decade. Yeah, which is kind of crazy. It's been a, I've had a very long journey with acting um, and with finding my own gifted voice and my authentic voice and really letting myself live the life that I know that I was meant to live, that I've known since I was in sixth grade, what I was what I was going to be doing in the world, but it took such a long time for me to give myself permission to actually just do it full time. Um, but so yeah, so that's where my love of Shakespeare started. And then it just, it's always once, I feel like once Shakespeare gets in there, it's, he, it creates such a deep, relationship once you can really start to understand the text and feel it and you go oh my god he shakespeare was able to name human experiences so specifically and some of the most difficult heightened experiences that we go through he was able to name it so specifically that it it just imprints itself on your heart and your spirit um so that's that's the short version of how I got into Shakespeare. 
Oh, that's really, really cool. I, th I think that way. I think that's true for this boy that I really, really just love him deep, deeply, but he just, it just, he just turns him on. And, and I've always loved Shakespeare. My mother was into the classics and, and things. And so we were introduced to it young. Um, and I have a connection, but it's different than those of you who are in the acting world who like are living it. Right. Appreciation on the other side. So I want to talk a little bit about that, about the, the, it's a social contract between you, the performer and the audience or the receiver of the performance, but there's an interaction there. So share a little bit about how that works for you and in, and in, in your experience. Well, it's different with different mediums and with different writers. And one of the great things about Shakespeare and why I think people love performing is it so much is you can actually come out and break the fourth wall and talk to the audience, mm -hmm. which is incredible. And it's such a wonderful experience because then you get to be even more present with each other. Yeah. Like you're talking about that, that social contract. And I think sometimes it's, it's surprising to the audience when you start talking to them, but it's a really singular experience because so often we have that imaginary fourth wall that we don't break and we're pretending like the audience isn't there. But with Shakespeare, you get to come out and interact and connect, which is really, really special. Yes, that's that gives me goosebumps because it's 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 really fun that way where you get to be in the audience and you're part of it. And it's not separate, not like you're watching TV or something like that. Right? right, exactly. And, you know, TV can be a very intimate experience as well. If you're watching a story that um, really relates in some way to your life or it really touches you, it's a different kind of intimacy, I think, than um, when you're live with another actor. And so that's what that's part of what got me into the the Rodenberg teaching and training. I both was trained in it and now I teach it. It's all about the basis of all of our training is in presence, because if you're going to talk to the audience, <laughs> you've got to be able to be present. You've got to be able to connect and you've got to be able to connect through words um, and really reach the audience. So it's a different kind of contract because you're saying I'm going to come out and be completely present with you, the audience, rather than just with my scene partner. Oh, yeah, that adds that whole other dimension to it. Yeah. And, and presence is so important. You know, we hear about it a, a lot about mindset and mindfulness and presence. I mean, it's been going that that conversation has been going on since before I was alive and before you were alive way for, you know, centuries in different places of the world. But it's getting more and more popular. People are waking up to the power of presence and the power of being in that moment. Yes. So, so do you have any um, special like reflections on your career or? Um, a performance you were doing where that power of presence took on a whole new thing and like really moved you in a different kind of way that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, um, I've had a few experiences lately. I took a long break from theater actually, and then I came back to it recently. And right before the pandemic, I got to do live theater and then um, I got pregnant and had a baby. So I had to take more time off. And then this year I've done two shows live um, a, a Pride and Prejudice, and now I'm doing Macbeth. And in both of those, there are real moments where this is a, maybe a bit off, off of topic, but it's such a special experience. And I know that it has to do with presence, so I'm going to articulate it. Uh, where you're performing, and you're so present, and you're so, so much just letting the material come through you, mm -hmm. that something happens that surprises you. And it feels like you're doing it, but you're not doing it. And those are, I mean, for me as an actor, those are like the peak experiences that I'm really after. And, and I think those moments can also bring the audience into their own presence too, which is really wonderful. Um, if you can so, as an actor, be so present and give yourself over to the work so much that something else takes over, uh, a woman that I used to work with talked about it like jazz, where you do all of your work, you practice so much, and then you get up there and you're, you're, you're so committed to what you're doing that it's you and it's not you. You know, you get to let go and get into that flow state and incredible things happen. And I think that's 
why a lot of people love doing live theater. A lot of actors love doing live theater. And hopefully the audience is moved by those things as well. And we can all contemplate our humanity together, our shared humanity. That's, that's what it's all about for me. I, I think that's, a, that's like the best description I've heard of it. Because when, when you're talking, I'm going, well, of course, when you totally give yourself into the work, that's where the divine comes in. And now we have this <laughs> yeah. inspired divine connection that transcends words yes yet we can all feel it yes and you said divine that was the word I was missing <laughs> and and um and that's the magic of it and it, is. it is it's the magic and uh it's the magic of it and and I love that and I and I love the the description of what it's like in, in your experience of going into flow. And then it just, it takes over and then it, it becomes its own thing that is magical and beautiful that. So as you're performing it, you're also witnessing it. Yes. And you've tapped into something bigger than yourself. And sometimes it's the whole company of actors doing it together. Sometimes it's you, uh, but that, um, that magic is always what I'm after, I think, as an actor. And, I, and what it just was reminding me how there was so there was so much heartbreak during quarantine and the pandemic, um, but not having any ability to be together and do live theater, m some part of my soul was just crushed every day. It was yeah. so challenging. And that was one of the questions that I that I really wanted to uh, also connect with with you to ask about actually is I work with a lot of musicians performing, ah. performing musicians and who are on stage a lot and on tour a lot and of course there was none of that Ugh. for a while and it was really really difficult and because it, it was like their creative juices got atrophied and stunted even though the well was still trying to spring <laughs> so it was like this this weird weird push right and then when people started getting to go back and play again, which was the ultimate goal and dream. Yes. With this underlying fear of what's going to happen. Is it going to get taken away again? Is what, and there was all of this angst. Did you feel any of that kind of angst when you could go back and, and do theater again? Absolutely. It, the performance of Pride and Prejudice I did was in it was February into March. I remember my daughter was five months uh, old or four to five months and it was the first time I was back in a room with people it was the first time back performing in several years and it was really hard to trust that it was going to be okay it was hard to trust in my body it was hard to get a full breath in um but it was healing to just show up to rehearsal every day and trust a little bit more and work and it was like small step by small step but even now I think there's still a part of me that's holding back a little bit because you never know if a cast member is going to get COVID and we'll have to shut down or, or things like that. So I think it's a, my answer is that it's a gradual process for me. It's like little steps towards feeling okay and safe again. Right. Right. And then any kind, anytime we have that kind of hesitation in us, yeah. then our creative juices, either they either have to bust through or they hold back or it, it can kind of get a little yeah. wonky. And so that's where patience, I think, comes in a little bit with ourselves. I totally agree. I'm so glad you're saying this, actually. I haven't I haven't really thought this through, but it's absolutely been happening. It, it is hard to just trust that we are back in whatever imperfect form we're back in performing live. And that if it if there are bumps along the way, that's all right as well. But we're we're moving in the direction of and also life is uncertain. Right. Like it just is. Right. Right. And, you know, I, I, I sit here and go, well, we're not going back. We want to say we're going back, but we're really not going back because you can't go back. There's no back. And, and when we realize that and we say, okay, well, how do we want to move forward in the most amazing way that we possibly can? Right. Then what if we can take the, 
it's kind of like I, I keep seeing this garden hose like, OK, so all the creative juices were all stunted and planted oh. off. And then now when you open it up, that water comes gushing out. Right? right. And so I'm like, well, what if now there's even more amazing creativity and connection and authenticity and and, you know, communication, because it was all just kind of percolating in there. And now finally gets an opening and it bursts out. Yeah. What if there's value in it? There, there absolutely might be. And I think we're finding that. And it's funny, actually, because there was um, there were so many productions of Macbeth this year and last year. There was one on Broadway. There's so many different theater companies doing it. And my explanation is just that people had gone back to what is the play we most want to do when we can do plays again? What is the play that most moves us or that we love? And I think a lot of people came up with Macbeth. And that was the first thing they all wanted to do after the pandemic. And people can tell me if I'm wrong, but that was the sense I got that people were just trying to connect with what was most important to them. Right. And and put them into the world. Right. It's connected. It, it moves us all. Yes. Um, what stories do we need to tell right now to make sense of this new reality we're in? Right. And it's the actors and the musicians and the artists that help people make sense of their world. The lyrics of the songs, the performances, the graphic arts, the, all of that, the artists and creators, I'm getting goosebumps, are here, are here and gifted with the ability to make sense of the world and help translate it to people. That's part of the social contract. That's a, such a good way of putting it. And I had uh, this wonderful actor who's done a lot of Shakespeare say that to me when we were in rehearsal, he said, um, he actually stepped up from assistant director to be to help direct the show too. But, but he said to me, we go through it on stage so that the people watching don't have to. Mm -hmm. But we give ourselves over to it completely and we go through it so you so that you can see what that looks like. And you don't have to go and, you know, murder a king with your husband. <laughs> right. You don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing my uh, mentor, Patsy Rodenberg, used to say or says is that theater is about teaching us or helping us understand how to bear the unbearable. Mm -hmm. You know, if we can see other people go through it, maybe we can also understand that we can go through it as well. Right. There's that, that's that common human connection. You know, we're all in this, in this human world together so that we can all connect to it in different ways. So that's a perfect way to say, okay, I want to now talk about, I work, you know, with gifted people in the world. I, I, I have a personal belief that people who are gifted, um, which means intelligent and creative, I call them intensely sensitive, which means over excitabilities, high functioning brain, really passionate with spiritual connection of intuition, empathy, and being able to put those two things together which is different than highly sensitive and it's different than just gifted. The people that I, that I really like to see as stepping into their authentic sovereign selves. Ooh, that's they a, are here. Yeah. They are here for a mission probably greater than they realize. Like you don't know, you'll never know how many lives you've impacted by every performance you've ever done because there's just no way to get that feedback. Right. That's so true. So how, what are some things <laughs> that, anybody who's listening, including, you know, me and people that I know, um, like, okay, we want to stand in our sovereign selves a little more. We want to use our voice a little bit more um, authentically, yes. a little bit more effectively. Yes. And for gifted people, a lot of times we live in our head and speaking is sometimes a trick or mm -hmm. we're too busy running around because we have different overexcitabilities. Or I also have gifted people that I work with that are very intuitive and they don't know what to do with the messages they get. And mm -hmm. so then they get into fear and then it shuts down their voice. Absolutely. So what are some steps? How do we do this? If we're, <laughs> if we're kind of a little bit on the shy or shut down side, or we're not really sure, how can we tell if we're being authentic? What can we do? Like, where would you start somebody? Cause I know you help people learn how to do this. Yes, so, I do. so where do we start? What do we do? Give us some hints. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say that I was, I am one of those people and I was intensely shy and I barely spoke in school. I was a good student, but I barely spoke. Somehow I got through school without <laughs> ever expressing my uh, opinions. But 
I was very shy, introverted, I was in my head all the time, and I mean, one of the first things you can do is breathe. It's, people talk a lot about, there's different ways to answer this question, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it down in a couple parts, because I'm a, I work with the body and the breath and the voice, and when you're doing that, you're working with the spirit and the heart and the soul. There's just, there's no separation between the two. So I always start on a very practical level working with people physically um, on their breath system and on freeing their voice. And when I say freeing your voice, it's freeing it from extra tensions, extra habits that make it hard to communicate or speak. And that thing you said about fear shutting down your voice is so true. It's actually literally true physically, because when you get into a situation where you feel stressed or scared or it's high pressure even even something you're excited about and it's high pressure your physical and vocal habits emerge <laughs> and they make it even harder to speak and communicate so and a lot of these habits are unconscious for example i might have a tight jaw and i don't even notice that it's tight and um we'll work on releasing the jaw just so you can free your voice and connect more through your voice will work on, sometimes it's just in the spine, sometimes it's a collapsed spine, and you just gotta come up through your spine, breathe deep into your belly, and speak from there. So we're, we're always working on the physical piece of it, the very practical physical part that comes out of classical training. And then the other piece of it is learning how to be okay taking up the space that you take up in the world right? Not more space than you need to take up and not less space. So that's an energetic thing. That's a mental and emotional thing. And that's a physical thing. So it's, we can work on all sides of it where there's a different ways into the same room, if you will, different doors into the same room. Is that making sense? You're making perfect sense. Okay, good. You're, good. you are making such perfect sense that it's like, whoa, I didn't, I didn't think of it that way. Um, I remember I got Rolfed <gasps> and um, I love getting Rolfed. It really helped me. And I thought it was, I heard you could grow a half an inch and I was four eleven and a half and I wanted to be five feet. And so that's why I got <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting into. But <laughs> you just made me remember when she did my jaw, I think it was session seven or eight or something. She goes, now be really, very careful because <laughs> you're going to say things. Right. And I'm like, wow. Yes. And I was the director of a fairly large and prestigious substance abuse treatment center at the time. And I went back to work. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't remember all the details are now, which because this is decades ago, but somebody said, one of the clients says, what, well, you know, you say, I'm not going to make it. Why not? Or something. And I turned and I said, you want to know? <laughs> it just <laughs> well, the person called me several years later and said, you know, you were right. Thank you for saying that, which yeah. is Thank you. That that what came out of my mouth was real and helpful. Yes. But I remember once my jaw got loosened in that way, you could speak again. That I could speak, and my voice didn't have this higher pitch. It was more, yes. more whole or grounded, something like that. Yes. And that so, is, go ahead. Is that it? Is that that? And that's what you're talking about, right? That's exactly what I do with people, and it's it's. We always try and put it back into speaking, put it back into the work. If we're working on Shakespeare, we put it back into Shakespeare. Sometimes I work with non-actors on like a poem that they like or a song. But yes, you, that's so funny that you said that because I find that often that sometimes people with a tight jaw have been told not to say something or they spend a lot of time in their life just trying to hold, hold it in. You know what I mean? And that's incredible that as soon as you loosened your jaw, you started just speaking truth to people. Right. And so gift and for gifted people, a lot of gifted kids love to ask questions. And so if they've been told to be quiet or shut up in any one of the sundry ways by parents, teachers or others, yes. then it would be probable that as they grow older, clinching to hold it in, hold it in, hold it yeah. in, they could become adults having a difficult time self-expressing. And really, it's an old energetic pattern because somewhere they learned it wasn't OK to say their truth. Yes. Absolutely. And that can land in the body in, in, in so many different ways. It may be that you stop breathing deeply because you don't want to be actually feel what you're feeling because you can't speak what you're feeling. It's not safe to do that. 
there's so many different ways that this happens. And people, it, people often just say to me, once we've released a tension in the body, they say to me, oh my goodness, that's because of this. Or they, they make the connection themselves because we're working on it, on it with breath um, and speech and voice. But people often make the connections like you just did. But it's the same, we're, we're just trying to get into the same room, different door, you know, Rolfing, the work I do. And that room is you not having to clench your jaw and not speak your truth. You being able to stand at your full height. You know, I'm, I'm five foot 11 and I used to, I'll, I'll speak it out, but if you can see, I used to, you know, stand with a curved back. I was pretending like I was five, six. I really didn't want people to notice me or see me. And that's something that manifests in my voice as well, because when you're, when you're standing with your spine curved inward, you can't get a very deep breath and it's hard to speak. So I used to speak a lot more like this. I was, I was really quiet. Um, but through, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can hear it, right? Right. Right. And so again, the, the human body and psyche and spirit are so, it's such a wonderful system. You know, your body's just trying to help you. Your jaw is tight for a good reason, or it was tight for a good reason, right? Are all, they're all defense systems. If you can't speak your truth, if it's not safe to speak your truth, your body's gonna try and help you. Okay, well, we're gonna clench our jaw, or we're gonna not breathe, or we're gonna slouch, or whatever that is. But once you're out of that situation and it's safe to be you again, you've gotta re-engage those emotional and physical muscles so that you can really truly be authentically yourself and your gifted self. Oh, that this is hitting home on so many levels. I have so many goosebumps because one of the things that I talk about is psychological safety. Ah, and yes. It's important that we feel safe and we live in a, in, in a society, in a country, in a world where safety it comes into question often for lots of different reasons, externally, internally, no, 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 you know, we go. And, and if we're not psychologically safe, the yes. system goes into danger mode and starts shutting itself down in order to cert- keep the organism alive. Exactly. And then that causes a lot of secondary physical and mental and emotional issues, including yep. nervous system disruptions. There's all kinds of things. And so safety is so together. Absolutely. And I love your analogy of different doors into the same room. Like when yeah. I when you say that, I'm like, oh, that's a perfect descriptor because we come into it through body work and breath and learning and understanding yes. and for gifted people gifted people and you're one of us you we love to go down the rabbit hole like oh okay i want to learn about this and then pretty soon i've dove into it or we're doing that and then we also have distractions so we'll do five or six things i mean most of my friends have five or six books we're reading at one time because there's so many things we're doing and and it's important that we slow down enough to breathe into life and Mm. create that safety yes and I talk about, I was just working with a group of actors in a class. And when we're working in a class on Shakespeare, we work in ensemble, which means that we are all present with each other all the time when we're working. And it's actually an amazing thing to do because you get to be seen and witnessed in your own presence and people are paying attention to you and with their full attention while you're working. But the but the thing I was saying to the class was that maybe there's no true, true safety, right? Maybe we're just going to make a space that is safe enough for us to work. And I would suggest that being present is actually safer than not being present. Right. Yeah. Um, But yeah, there may be, there's always going to be things that happen in life that are unsafe. And I think we've all been dealing with that at least for the last few years, um, this, feeling of that we are not safe <laughs> that if somebody comes close to us and breathes on us we could die right right well and i think that whole safety thing when we talk about the united states there's a lot of listeners here not in the united states but in the united states i think that that ramp up of fear started at 9 11 oh absolutely and, and then you know you're in new york city okay so you get that and then and then it's just escalated with different topics yes over time. And so the systems are all vibrating really high. And 
in fear, you're reactive, right? And that's the same thing that's happening in your body. Your body senses fear, it senses danger, it reacts and tries to help you. So you stop breathing deeply, <laughs> whatever, right. whatever that is. Your fight or flight takes over and you start breathing up into your upper chest with short breaths rather than deep breaths. Um, and again, it's just your body trying to help you. But once that fear system is activated, it's easier to get people to be reactive yes. and to, yeah. Yeah, oh, we are on the same page. So now I want to go to the, another thing that you said yes. that I think is really important for everyone. And I see it with a lot of my clients. Mm -hmm. And that is taking up the space that's yours, that's rightfully yours. Um, yeah. A while ago, um, I had a lot of back pain and um, <laughs> I was at this event. And so we were doing these role play things. I was interviewing somebody. I don't remember what it was now. But anyway, you had to get up on the stage, which yeah. I'm 100% introverted. That's a little tricky, but I will do it. Because once I get on the stage or once the camera's on, they call me one take wonder. I just go. And right. it, that energy just takes over. And that's great. It's the getting me up there. That's a little tricky. But once I say yes, I'll do it. You know, well, I went to get up on the stage. Oh, I got on the stage and I went to do it. And they had these really high bar stools. Now I'm 4'11". And I could not physically get up, push myself up at the time. I was in so much physical pain. Just going up two steps to get on the stage was tricky. Wow. And so I asked for a lower chair. And by the time I, I had got all that to happen, the pain was really escalating. So when I sat in the chair, I was more closed in than I otherwise would because I was physically hurting. Exactly. And one of the things the feedback people in the audience said, because we were kind of role playing and then they would give us feedback, said, well, you need to take up more space in the world. Huh. And, um, and, and I didn't say anything back because that wasn't the point, but I'm like, okay, well, my physical pain was shrinking me in. And I knew that. But then I started thinking about my history, but also I started thinking about gifted people as a whole. Mm. that you're smart. You should know the answer to this. You know, we hear that all the time or you're lucky or this or that or blah, blah, all the, all the judgment. And I watch people who could be standing in their authority, shrinking, 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 either physically turning in like you yeah. were saying or shrinking with what they let show up in the world. So they, they dive into their brain or they dive into their inner landscape and they don't show up which then their authentic voice can't come, you know, and it, and it really impacts that you deserve to be here. Yes. And you deserve to have a voice and you're, and you deserve to take up the space that you're meant to take up. Like you said, not too much, not too little. It's not about being grandiose, but no, it's also no. not about putting your head in the sand. Exactly. So how does somebody here? So here's the question. I'm ready. I, this, I want to know the answer to this. So if somebody is sitting here listening to us going, yeah, that's true. Aaron's right. Aaron's right. Okay. Well, how do we know when we are taking up the appropriate space when we're not too little and not too big? Like, how do we know when this, okay, but like, this is my authentic space. How do, what are some ways we can know that? One of the ways you can know it. Well, it's hard because I do so much in person and online actually. Um, but when you're present, you can feel how much space you take up and you can feel say for example sometimes people stand too close to you right mm. or sometimes they stand too far away when they talk to you there's when both people are present and in their bodies you can feel what's the right amount of space that okay. you want to have between you when you speak so the uh, let's see i mean i could give you the very practical physical like bare bones of what I do to, to, so that people could check in with themselves. Yeah, let's do that. Let's have everybody check in with yourselves real quick. Darren's going to give us a little sample of how to do this because I think it's so important because I think people are so disembodied and they're in their head or they don't know where they're disconnected and any little thing you can do with us, I think would help everybody. I would, this would be my absolute pleasure. I love doing this more than anything. Um, can I say one thing? before we start. So what we've been talking about in terms of collapsing in on yourself, that we refer to as first circle energy. Uh, we, have, we talk about three circles of energy in the Rodenberg work. And then third circle of energy is where you're taking up too much space, right? And you're using too much vocal energy. It probably got really annoying to listen to me. <laughs> yeah. So that tends to be our reaction to 
you know, the world being unsafe, either we collapse in on ourselves or we explode out and try and look bigger than we are and look more impressive. And Mm -hmm. it's probably a familiar, (laughs) we notice that you'll start to notice this about other people when you start to think about it in this way. And then in between those two is second circle. And that's where your presence is. So you're not collapsed in on yourself and you're not overly expanded. You are just existing in your body as you are. So if we're going to check in on that, let's say, should we, should I give them standing or sitting? Either way, if some people listen to the show standing or sitting, you tell everybody and they can, they can go back and listen to it. But just imagine that we're all sitting here and we're listening and we have our tea and <laughs> we're, enjoy, we're enjoying this. What is something that we could get our, get our teeth into a little bit? And then everybody, you can check out Erin's website because she'll do this with you personally. You can call her and and say, hey, you know, I want to learn these things and she'd be happy to teach you. So let's just get a little sample. Let's get a sample. Okay, so let's try sitting. So wherever you are sitting, um, we're going to we're going to check in with our spine and our breath. So what you can do is you sit, put both of your feet on the ground and see if you can find a nice, comfortable, upright stance that isn't overly rigid and extended or um, collapsed in on your spine. But we're going we're gonna to do a little something on that. So you can place one hand on your upper chest and one on your lower belly. And what you want to do is engage your lower belly breath. That's the breath that we all come into the world with. It's the breath that we get with most ease. And it tells our body that we're okay and that we're calm. Um, try for one second breathing into the hand on your upper chest. See if you can make your upper chest move. That's our fight or flight breath, which is really useful when we're being chased by a bear or <laughs> we need to freeze or we're in a life-threatening situation, but we don't need that, that breath in our day-to-day. Um, I could get more into that with the things that stress does to the body and all that. But so try and breathe into the hand in your lower belly and just take a couple breaths there. This is the present breath. This is the I am okay as I am breath, right? Mm -hmm. And then try and collapse your spine and see what that does. Harder to breathe low. This is first circle energy and and I'm finding it harder to speak actually right now. All my energy and my breathing went went right up into my head. And when I went like this, it all went straight up. It was like, whoop. Yep. And And that's what you're talking about, things getting caught in our throat too. If you speak like this for a while, you could, you'll start to feel tension in different places. Um, okay, great. Now come back up to a nice, nice upright spine, just with a natural curve in our spine. Um, and then breathe again. And then try and extend your spine forward. Lift your upper chest. And we'll just, we'll overdo it a little bit. But this is, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, this is third circle, right? How do you feel when you're sitting like this? A little, hey, what are you doing, Aaron? <laughs> Right? Like a little impressive. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then see what happens to your breath then. It goes I right back like, up here. Yep, yeah, right back up here, right? Right back into the upper chest. Uh-huh. And then if you're speaking from there a lot, you can actually really damage your voice. This is why this comes up in actor training, because we use our voices so much. Um, or that's where the seed of this work was, was in actor training, because we people lose their voices. If, if they're up like this and doing shows like this eight days a week, you're gonna, you're gonna damage your voice and lose it. So then let that go, ah, shake it out a little and just come right back to that second circle, naturally upright spine, no overextension, no collapsing and breathing into your low belly. And then from there, just for fun, um, describe something in your room and see how it feels to talk like that. Uh, I'll talk about my wallpaper. I have, I have some birds on my wallpaper. You can talk about the weather outside <laughs> and then collapse your spine again and try and talk from there. Um, I've got wallpaper. I've got some books. Can you feel the constriction? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then if you overextend your spine and talk from there, really feel, feel what happens to your voice there. Yeah, we're, we're exaggerating it so you can really feel it. In life, these things are often, can, can get very subtle. It can be just a slight lifting in your upper chest, or maybe you just lift your chin a little bit, a little bit above everybody else. 
but that that can um, change your voice and also gets you out of your presence. And we notice it, right? Like you, you, you immediately made connections to different kinds of people when you were seeing me do this. You, you immediately, see- I, I was having flashbacks to a um, business networking event years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know, and, or the how oh, yes. do it, or the, all the different postures and and voices, and and I'm like, and I being an intuitive empath, highly sensitive, intensely sensitive, gifted person, I notice it all, and I'm Absolutely. like, okay, y'all, I have to like have some, I, I need a break. There's a lot of this going on because the authenticity and the just the real connection, the authentic connection was absent. Yeah, uh, not in everybody, but in a large number of people because of the cultural thing, it's networking. You're supposed to put on a show right? or whatever the belief was. I just thought it was odd. And I had to, I had to leave early. Once it, once it got to a certain level of volume, I had to leave because it was too much. Yeah. I mean, once one person starts talking like this, everybody has to talk like this. (laughs) So, but we are, we, I, I have to say when we are in second circle and we're present and just breathing and we are, in a physical place where we are just taking up the space we take up in the world, it's such a gift to other people as well. It relaxes them. It lets them know that they're safe enough <laughs> and that yeah. you're safe enough, right? Because physically and with your breath and with your voice, you are showing them that you are present and you are okay, so they are okay. And and that's important, be, you know, especially for all of us who are highly tuned in because mm. we're, we read people and we read the energy energetically yes. way before there's a, a word. Absolutely. And We're so, so sensitive and intuitive as people. We really, you can feel it. Like you said, you go into a room, there's too much third circle energy. You got to leave because it's just too much. So it all comes down to breathing and being present, which yep. I have some of my gifted clients and friends who every time I say it comes down to breathing and being present, they stamp their princess feet. Now, why are you saying that again? We can't be doing that. It's not all about blah, 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 blah. So everybody who's ever complained or pushed back about it, Aaron just said it perfectly. We're coming to the same room through lots of different doors. That's my paraphrase of what you said. Yep. That's, and that, my friends, is important that sometimes these simple yet not always easy mm. things are the most profound and they're universal. Yes. So you don't get to, you don't have a, a, you know, get out of breathing card free class. You get to, you have to breathe, you know, like you don't get to skip this part. You know <laughs> what I mean? Because you're gifted. In fact, you need it more because you're gifted. You absolutely need it more. And all if you, yeah. you've absorbed all the things that have happened in your life, it really can land in the body and the breath. It does land in the body and the it breath. Does. The body bears the burden every time. Absolutely. And um, and I tell everybody, because I work a lot with people who are, have different addictions, I'm like, well, holding your breath and regulating your breath differently is the very first thing we learn as infants to how to moderate pain. So yeah. when we work, we play with our food, then we mess up our sexuality, and then we find drugs and alcohol. So if you're somebody who's trying not to do obsessive behavior over here, the core issue that's off is breathing. Yes. So it's universal. So I know when you're done stamping your princess feet and arguing about it, take a few breaths. And if you want some help, you call Erin, her information's in the show notes, or you can call me and I'll set you free, you know, too, because I'll say here, call Erin is what I'll say. And so, but I have a couple last questions. This is so helpful to me. I could talk to you forever about all this um, because I think it's really useful. And I'm remembering things about my own world. I remember how depressed I was in elementary school from all the trauma going on and how I I, I'm 411 and how caved in I was and how I could, couldn't even utter my last name and the healing I've had to do to be able to live in my voice and sit up straight and be in my space. The Mm -hmm. work that had to go into that because of the damage and the disconnection to my intensely sensitive being you know, that was out of my control um, at the time. So it's all very interesting. And I think it, it relates to everybody. And so being an actor and playing Lady Macbeth and be doing all the wonderful things you're doing is really universal. 
Um, so, so it's just not, oh, she's an actor. And so therefore it, those rules don't apply to me because I'm not an actor. It's quite the opposite. I mean, I teach as well. And for me, because I am, I was so shy and I am more of an introvert. I'm, I'm a, one of those funny actors that's an introverted extrovert. Like I can be on stage. I love to be in character, but as soon as I have to be myself, I get really introverted and really shy. So for me, this work is also so helpful in coaching and teaching because then I can fully be present and with people. And my journey, oh my gosh, my journey in finding my own voice, it's probably why I wanted to be an actor in the first place is so that I could do this healing for myself sure. uh, because I needed it so badly so that I could express some part of myself and find my own voice. So my journey has been long as well. And I always say to people, if you had seen me 15 years ago, you would be shocked that I can speak in front of people at all. <laughs> I relate to that. I'm an extroverted introvert too. I knew, I knew when I met you, I'm like, Oh, she's amazing. So I have two final questions because yes. um, I want to be very respectful of your time. And, and, and one question is what is the most memorable food you've ever eaten? What isn't the most memorable food I've ever eaten? I love food so much. You know, it's hilarious. I love food so much, but the first thing I thought of was this amazing sandwich I made yesterday that had turkey and fresh mozzarella and some amazing tomatoes and some really good greens. Oh, it was just perfect. <laughs> ah, I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, that's it. It's an opportunity to eat more wonderful food as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so all food that's good food. Aaron's in on. And um, if you're really loving everything Aaron's saying, don't forget, check out the show notes, follow her on social media, her website's there too. So you can go um, and learn more about Aaron and all of her great work. So is there anything that you wanted to share that I've not asked you about or didn't come up? Because before I ask the last question and we close the show, I always like people to be able to know that you're being heard. And I want you to feel confident and complete as we end the interview. I feel really good to tell you the truth. I love talking about this work. It has changed my life and I love seeing it change other people's lives. And I believe it is the most moral, empowering work I can do to help people get their voices back and get in touch with their presence in a way that, yeah, maybe the world will knock you around more, but you can always come back to it and you can always come back to your voice and your breath. So. I'm just really happy to have the opportunity to talk about it because this is my my soul's work, you know, acting and then working with people um, on on their voices and speech. So thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Awesome. And so for your final question of the interview, and that is, is we're going to put billboards up all around the world with Aaron Roth's quote on it. What is going to be on your billboard? You deserve to take up space. Love it. You deserve to take up space. That's yeah. beautiful. Well, <laughs> I want to thank you, Aaron, for being on the show, for sharing so freely, giving us a demonstration and just being fully present with us. And congratulations on um, being Lady Macbeth, too. Oh, thank you so much. It's a beautiful thing. And I'm very happy to be doing it. And thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So remember, everybody, put your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star. You're here on purpose with a purpose. So go out there and be you and breathe and live in your authentic space, as Aaron says. And until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well. Thank you for listening. I trust you gained some valuable inspiration and information. Please join me and other visionaries in the Someone Gets Me Facebook group. Or for more information on my services and additional episodes, visit someonegetsme.com. Again, thanks for listening.